Okay, I know. The title of this video seems a little clickbaity, but I promise that it is exactly as it seems. Here, at least in the United States, we have deemed that some water pollution really is okay, and we regulate that. And we regulate that through the MPDES system, or the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. Like, no one calls it by its full name. It's always referred to as the MPDES, and so that's what you're going to hear me say a lot in this video. So, what exactly do we mean by this? So, this National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES for short, was helped, or it was created to help the Clean Water Act. So if you recall, if you watched my Clean Water Act video, that part of the Clean Water Act is to regulate point source pollution in different bodies of water in the United States. And it's not every single body of water, but it's a vast majority of it. If the water like doesn't lead to a bigger body of water, that's pretty much like the exception to the rule. But in that video, and so far, all we've said is they regulate it. And we didn't really say anything else. And that's what really this video is going to explore is how do we regulate this point source pollution? And the way we do it here in the United States um, through the EPA and through this Clean Water Act is through a permitting system. Now, permits are essentially a way of saying, hey, company A, you can pollute, but you need to tell us about it. You need to apply for the permit. You need to pay for it. You need to monitor it, and we're also going to tell you if you're doing it too much. Like, we're going to approve how much you're allowed to discharge, how much you're allowed to pollute, essentially. And this is because we, as a society, recognize that having no pollution, while well, an amazing solution, right? Everything would be solved if we just didn't pollute. It's not realistic. The processes that we currently have have wastes. We're getting better. We're getting better at controlling those wastes and eliminating those wastes, but it's not perfect. We also can't just say, huh, no waste, because that's also going to kind of stop society um, more so than you would imagine. So this is why we allow that water pollution in the first place. So permits, the MPDS permit is for all point source polluters. There are some provisions for non-point source pollution, but honestly, they're so weak. Because again, non-point source pollution is like society as a whole is creating pollution. Really hard to regulate that. So I do just want to put that caveat in there is that MPDS can also permit non-point source pollution. It's just not a great system. So this video really is just not going to explore that that much. So this is mostly focusing on our point source polluters, and it's every point source polluter. If you are going to discharge any kind of waste into a body of water, you must get a permit. And in that last video, we talked about different types of waste. Sure, heavy metals and nutrients, but even things like temperature is considered a waste. So there's two factors that go into that permitting process. One, what technology currently exists to control pollution of that factor. And this is kind of twofold, right? We recognize, and we as a society, as a government, as a regulatory agency, we recognize that if you have chemical B, it might be really new, or we might not really know how to get rid of it, or it might be insanely cost uh, prohibitive to get rid of it. We recognize that it might not be fair, so to speak, to say, well, you can't get you 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 can't eliminate it. End of story. Because maybe they're creating something that's really needed in our society. I do apologize for being vague just because they, there's lots of different examples, none that I know of, but there are different examples of this. So one thing that gets considered is what technology exists to help control that pollution. The other consideration is where are you dumping this? this chemical? What is the quality of the stream, of the river, of the lake that you want to discharge your waste into? Because what that body of water currently is will dictate how much pollution it can accept and naturally process. 
So the next few slides are essentially going to talk about like what dictates that amount. You know, if I apply for a permit to discharge five units of mercury a day into a local stream, like how did that five come to be? Like how, how did we come up with that number? So I'm going to simplify this as best as I can. And for those of you who maybe know the MPDS system really well, because maybe that's your job, I recognize that I'm probably oversimplifying a lot of this, but that's kind of the point of this video. But so I just say this because those of you who might work in the field might recognize I'm missing some things and you're right. So in general, very first step is really focusing on the water body. So not even on the pollution, let's look at the water. And what the states do, so it's a federal law and it's the EPA, so a federal agency who's creating these laws, but it's really the states that kind of implement, dictate, regulate, and kind of do all the work under this law. So you're going to see me emphasize the word states a lot. The first thing they do is they determine the designated use of all waters within their borders. Now you see this all has an asterisk. This is referring to my previous video on the Clean Water Act. Remember, not all water bodies are regulated. An agricultural uh, ditch or canal, not regulated. Streams, you want to, bodies of water that are only temporary and don't connect to larger bodies of water, that doesn't count. So think of large lakes, rivers, and streams uh, is typically what we're referring to. So by designated use, it's essentially the state saying, hey, this stream, we, the, the main use for this stream, or the main use we want for this stream is fishing. Or we want it to be water contact recreation, meaning the human comes in contact with the water. So swimming, for example. We want to use this body of water for a public water supply. These are just a handful of different designated uses. There's a, a couple of more as well. So first the state says, hey, yeah, we want to use this and the main use is for fishing and we intend people to possibly be eating the fish that they catch in this water body. Now, based on that designated use, this is going to dictate the water quality standards. Obviously, the standard for how clean your water should be is probably going to be a lot higher for a public water supply then it will be for boating, right? And boating, you're not even touching the water. So yeah, we want our water quality standards to be pretty high if we're going to be drinking it. But if we're just going to be, you know, taking our boat through it, eh, it doesn't need to be as high. So what's the use? And depending on the use, that's going to impact kind of your standard for water quality in that body of water. Okay, so I've created this list. I got all my water bodies in the state. And I've got the uses for them, and I know my standards for all of them. Well, now that you know your standards, the states need to identify which of these water bodies are impaired. And this impaired word is a key word. It's literally referred to as the impaired waters list. So impaired, like, means something. It's not just a word I chose. So of this list of water bodies, they've got these water quality standards. They're doing water testing and saying, hey, we want to use this for public drinking water. It has this set of standards and it's not meeting those standards. This water body has more pollution than the standard that's set for it. And so states are going to say, hey, like this body of water, this A river is going to be listed as an impaired water. So here I've taken a screenshot. Um, this is from the impaired waters list uh, for Maryland waters. And so it's telling you, you know, when was this first listed as an impaired water? Where is it? What's the basin name? Some other codes. Um, here's the designated use, aquatic life and wildlife. So this designated use is essentially saying, hey, people aren't using it. We're not drinking it. We're not fishing in it. We're not boating in it. But we do want to create some sort of standard for like life to live in it. So aquatic life and wildlife is actually probably the lowest standard and it's not even meeting that. It has so far been listed as impaired and it needs a TMDL. And we'll, we'll talk about that soon. So essentially we've done the first step. We know it's going to be used for aquatic life and wildlife that has a certain set of standards. We're doing water quality testing. Okay, it doesn't meet those standards. And the reason why? 
the pollutant is temperature. So most likely it's too hot. Uh, that's usually what we see. Um, and then it even says here, temperature measurements exceed criteria and no cold water obligate taxa were found. In layman's terms, this just means temperature hot, bugs that like cold, not there because too hot. I'm pretty sure I use more words than what that says. But point being, this is kind of what an assessment looks like. Like here was the designated use. We're not meeting it. And here's why we're not meeting it. All right. So we're impaired. Now it actually told us what the next step was. We need a TMDL. And I know lots of acronyms here. The TMDL is the total maximum daily load. This is the total maximum pollution that can be put in that water body daily. Because we recognize that nature can process stuff, right? There are natural pollutants in the environment that nature has been taking care of for billions of years. Humans are not unique. Humans are making a lot more pollution, but we recognize that nature can handle some pollution. So states will develop a TMDL, a total maximum daily load per pollutant. So that last creek was just temperature, but let's say it was temperature and mercury. There'd be a TMDL for temperature and there'd be a TMDL for mercury. And it's going to be unique per body of water because nature's ability in a stream that has a bunch of trees versus a stream without trees is going to be really different. So different things are considered when determining what this maximum load is. So loading capacity and is essentially thinking about the environment. Same with load allocations. What can the environment handle? And um, we also have a margin of safety. So sure, the environment can handle X, but we're not going to say, oh, then X is fine. We're going to go a little bit lower than that. And we're going to say, okay, well, just to be safe, let's say nature can handle 15 units a day. Let's do 10 units a day just to have that margin of safety. Different times of year, thinking about temperature, it will be warmer in the summer. So we may need to change our TMDL to account for the fact that temperature is naturally going to fluctuate. And then, of course, the TMDL needs to consider the water quality standard. You know, yes, I want to limit pollution, but if I'm only using this water body for boating, my standard's not going to be as high as it would be if I'm using it for water. All right, so we have an impaired water. That impaired water is going to get TMDLs assigned to it, essentially saying how much pollution can it affect. And then the last step would be modifying any MPDS permits. So remember, all point source polluters at all times have a permit, and these permits last for five years. This is just a screenshot taken from a permit. And you can see they have to uh, look at a couple of different things. So they're being permitted for flow, so how much water is leaving and how quickly it's leaving. pH, <coughs> excuse me, their total residual chlorine, uh, their dissolved oxygen, and their dissolved oxygen. There's two notes, um, and I can't remember what the notes are offhand, but it's based on the type of stream the dissolved oxygen goes in, which is why there's two different limits here. This is actually a great example. These two parameters from this person's permit, sometimes they emit water into one water body, sometimes they emit water into another water body. And if they have different designated uses of those water bodies, there's going to be different load allocations. Maybe that stream is able to withstand lower dissolved oxygen than the other one. So it's all dependent on nature, really. So it's a nature-driven process. It's nature telling us, hey, how much pollution can you handle? So if you are a permit holder and you're releasing a pollutant into a water body and it comes out that that water body is impaired, meaning it's not meeting its standard, then when you go to renew your MPDS permit, you might see some changes. They might say, hey, you know, with your dissolved oxygen, we're going to have to make it a little bit higher. You need to put more oxygen in your water because our environment isn't handling it right now. So it's not immediate. This is a slow process. You could make a change and be like, oh, there's an issue going on. And it could be decades. Yeah, 
honestly, decades before you start seeing a resolution, just because we want to be fair to companies and give them time to make their changes. And nature also needs time to kind of help repair itself. So we're going to end this by kind of talking about all those different steps, um, but talking about this example. So we have three factories along this river. And our first question is, what is this water used for? Let's just say we just want to use it for fish, uh, for wildlife. So kind of the lowest tier, like, hey, we just want to make sure like life can live in this water body. Okay. Well, <laughs> Well, when we go out and we do our water quality testing and we want to see, are we meeting that wildlife standard? We realize, no, it's not. Everything's dead because our water quality is just so bad. We are going to list this as an impaired water because it is not meeting its standard. Okay, so then, uh, and the reason it's not meeting its standard, sorry, is because there's mercury is too high. There's probably a lot of other issues if it's that brown. But let's say, and these numbers don't matter. But let's say we go out, we test the mercury, and mercury is at 50 milligrams per liter, way too high to be meeting a wildlife standard. All right, so mercury is our issue right now. Because we're saying it's impaired, we're going to create that total maximum daily load, or TMDL, for mercury for this water body. So very specific for the water body. And let's say that in my TMDL and in my analysis, we've determined, okay, nature can handle about 35 milligrams per liter. Remember, it's currently 50. But we're saying nature can handle 35. We know it fluctuates during the seasons. Uh, we also want to make sure we have a margin of safety. So let's say that we're allowed to actually pollute 15. Yes, nature can handle 35, but we are going to set it to 15. So now we've got a TMDL. We now have a goal. Here's the goal of the amount of pollution that we're going to let occur in nature and nature was going to handle it. So the last thing that will happen is this will then get applied to MPDS permits. These three factories already had permits, right? The second they wanted to start polluting, they had to get a permit. Well, the next time they renew their permit, sometime within the next five years, What's going to happen is the state is going to impose new limits if needed. I mean, for all we know, these factories, their, their permits are already pretty low. So we're saying, hey, we can pollute 15 milligrams into this stream. That means we're going to allocate five to each of these companies. So if this company current permit was six, we're going to deny the permit and say, no, you have to do five. Uh, that is what you've been allocated due to the water pollution issues that's happening in this stream. Again, if you work in the field, you know that this is so much more nuanced, but in my opinion, I'm a little biased. Uh, that's kind of more or less how it works. And then ideally, add like a decade or two or three, and you know, all these companies have been meeting their, their limits or maybe even surpassing their limits. And your fifth step would be reaching those water quality standards. Your, your mercury levels are low, your fish are back, wildlife is happy. That's kind of like, I just want to make a little heart. Like that's, that's what, that's our goal, right? And that's the government's goal. So, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the government like gets a bad rap and, and if they instruct rules, then everyone hates them. But in reality, it's really for our own interest, right? We like wildlife. We like clean drinking water. We like to be able to go boating. So these permitting systems and regulations really are in place to protect our own interests. So with that, again, very quick recap, the MPDES system is a way to get a permit to allow you to do uh, water pollution, essentially. We first need to figure out what water body you're going into, what is it going to be used for? So that's going to dictate how clean it needs to be. If it's impaired, we need to figure out how much we're allowed to put in. And that's going to be through a total maximum daily load or TMDL analysis. And then hopefully when those permits get updated and you add some time and you add some, I guess, really regulation, hopefully you're going to see a nice new environment um, that's a lot healthier than it was before.